So this slide just shows us some additional images over the structures that we've already gone over. So we're just going to cover this slide rather quickly. So once again, proximal epiphysis and the distal epiphysis, the ends of the long bone, the shaft, the diaphysis. We also discussed that articular cartilage uh, is covering the surface of the proximal epiphysis, which is this light blue area. So that's your articular cartilage made up of hyaline cartilage. And we also find this in the distal epiphysis, which again is this light blue area. So this area that I'm filling in, this is the articular cartilage. Once again, that's hyaline cartilage. And in the proximal epiphysis and the distal epiphysis, we have our spongy bone. And as we can see here, we have the epiphyseal line. So the fact that this says epiphyseal line, then what we have is bone. We also learned that at the core of the diaphysis is the medullary cavity filled with yellow bone marrow, which can be seen with the image on the right. And the external surface of the bone is covered by the periosteum, which once again does not cover the articular cartilage while the interior structures of bone is covered by the endosteum, which can be seen on the image on the right. And of course, we can't forget that compact bone makes up the wall of the diaphysis, as well as cortical bone that covers the spongy bone. Let's now discuss the structure of a typical flat bone. So a good example of a flat bone is one of the bones of the cranium, or the skull bone, the parietal bone, for example. So a typical structure of a flat bone resembles a sandwich of spongy bone. And this lies between two layers of compact bone, which of course we refer to as cortical bone or cortex. So if we look at the image down over here, we could see this layer of spongy bone. Clearly, again, spongy bone is totally appropriate since it does look like a sponge and we have the two layers of the compact bone. And remember what I said previously, that anytime we have spongy bone, we will always have an external shell or an external layer of compact bone that once again we refer to as cortical bone. Within the cranium, this layer of spongy bone is given an additional name and that name is called diploe. So here is another image of a flat bone, again, one of the cranial bones, and here is another one. Osseous tissue, which is also known as bone tissue, is a type of supporting connective tissue, and it contains specialized cells, a ground substance, plus extracellular protein fibers, which form the matrix of bone tissue. So in our discussion of osseous or bone tissue, we're going to consider the following. We're going to look at the matrix of bone, we're going to look at bone cells, the structure of compact and spongy bone, and the periosteum and endosteum. So let's begin with the matrix of bone. Now I often refer to it as the bony matrix. So it turns out that the matrix of bone, or the bony matrix, has two parts. The first part is the organic matrix, and the second part, or the second component, is the inorganic matrix. So let's look at what makes up the organic matrix. The bulk, or a majority of the makeup of the organic matrix, are the collagen fibers. So these collagen fibers provide tensile strength. So what does that mean? What that means is you can stretch the bone to a limited extent. And it also offers flexibility. So this allows bone to have some type of give feature, or it allows bone to bend somewhat. However, they offer little resistance to compression forces. So for example, when you stand up and the forces of gravity pushes upon our body, that's an example of a force that compresses bone. So the collagen fibers make up about one third of the weight of the bone. Another component of the organic matrix are the bone cells, which makes approximately 2% of the bone mass overall. The next component is the inorganic matrix. So the inorganic matrix is what gives bone its hardness, its rigidity, and provides the compression strength. So this is what makes bone hard is because of the inorganic matrix. So once again, it's a combination of both the bony matrix, the organic matrix plus the inorganic matrix.
So what are these inorganic matrix? What gives bone its rigidity? Well, the primary mineral or the primary component are the calcium salts. So calcium phosphate, which accounts for about two thirds of the weight of the bone, calcium hydroxide and calcium carbonate. So once again, these are all calcium salts. Now, if we take calcium phosphate and calcium hydroxide, what we form are what's called hydroxyapatite crystals. Calcium isn't the only mineral that we find in bone. There are other minerals as well, such as sodium, magnesium, fluoride, and phosphorus. So this phosphorus is what we find in phosphate, is what's going to give us calcium phosphate. So how the bony matrix is formed is it begins with the osteoblast. So let's look at this diagram or this picture that I illustrated to the right of this slide. So the osteoblast, something that we're going to look at in more detail when we look at the various bone cells, is responsible for producing the collagen fibers. So what I'll do is I'll use my green highlighter, all right? So these green lines represent the collagen fibers. So these collagen fibers is what's going to give us what's called the osteoid. So the collagen fibers or the osteoid is part of the organic matrix. At some point, the osteoblast is going to stimulate, it's going to promote the deposition or the crystallization of these calcium salts onto the osteoid. So imagine then that we have the calcium salts, and I'm just going to sort of do this, and these blue dots will represent the calcification or the deposition of the calcium salts onto the osteoid. So what we have is essentially the formation of the bony matrix. So it's a combination of the organic matrix, which gives bone its flexibility, and the inorganic matrix, which gives bone its rigidity. So there is an experiment that I like to refer to as the chicken bone experiment that you can do. So let's say you have a fresh chicken bone, and uh, you take that fresh chicken bone and you put it outside under the heat of the sun and leave it out there for a few days or so. You take that bone back inside, and if you drop that bone, that bone will shatter, as you can see over here, right? The bone shatters. And the reason being is because by leaving it outside, the sun basically breaks down the collagen fibers. It breaks down the organic matrix. So as a result, all you're left with is the inorganic matrix, primarily the calcium salts. So therefore, the bone has lost its flexibility. There is no give anymore. There is no bend. Well, if you take another fresh chicken bone, but this time you let it sit in vinegar, acidic acid, for a period of time. So allowing it to sit in the vinegar will erode, will dissolve away the inorganic matrix of bone, which again is primarily the calcium salts. So then you take the bone out of the vinegar and what you'll end up with is an extremely flexible bone, so much so that you can bend it and twist it as you see with the image down below. All you're left with is basically the organic matrix of bone. And again, this organic matrix, which is primarily the collagen fibers, the osteoid, is what allows the bone to bend as you see there because the vinegar has dissolved away the inorganic matrix, the calcium salts. Now, before we move on to the next slide, I just want to quickly mention about these calcium salts. Calcium must be obtained from our diet. Our body does not have the ability to make calcium, so we need to consume that from the foods that we take in. So if we are not eating foods or we're not eating a diet that has a high amount of calcium in it, then our body is not going to get that necessary calcium that it needs to form the inorganic matrix. And the result of that is seen later on when we discuss the importance of calcium. So let's now talk about the different types of bone cells that are part of the organic matrix of bone. So let's begin with the osteocytes. The osteocytes are mature bone cells. They account for most of the bone cell population 
they are amitotic, meaning they do not undergo mitosis, and they are confined within a lacuna. There are two major functions that the osteocytes do. The first function is they maintain and monitor the protein and mineral content of the surrounding bony matrix. They also participate in the repair of damaged bone, such as in the case of a fracture. So when we fracture a bone, we've essentially broken the bone. So I've made some illustrations both to the left and to the right of this slide of the osteocyte. So let's look at the first illustration to the left. So these osteocytes look like a starfish. They have these many cytoplasmic extensions, these arm-like projections. Now, they are surrounded by the bony matrix, which are shaded in in this dark gray area. So these osteocytes cannot move. They're literally stuck. Now, the space that we find these osteocytes that are confined in is referred to as a lacuna. Now, if we're looking at more than one space, then it's referred to as a lacuni. So this is one osteocyte within a lacuna. Now, it turns out that these cytoplasmic extensions, these arm-like projections uh, of these osteocytes will actually reach out and touch other osteocytes, as you can see with the illustration that I made to the right. So I have here two osteocytes where they have these arm-like projections reaching out and touching other osteocytes. So I've drawn two osteocytes. Now their arm-like projections or cytoplasmic extensions will pass through these tiny little openings, these tiny little canals. So we refer to this tiny little opening or canal-like structure as canaliculus if we're looking at one, or canaliculi if we're looking at more than one. So once again, these are openings, canal-like openings that allow for the cytoplasmic extensions of the osteocytes to extend and to communicate with other osteocytes. So basically, their plasma membrane will touch other plasma membranes of other osteocytes. So what we find are these cellular junctions, something that we've already talked about, called gap junctions. So these gap junctions will allow the osteocytes to share the oxygen, to share the nutrients, because it'll spread from one osteocyte to the next because of the fact that we have these gap junctions, these communicating junctions. Another type of bone cell are the osteoblasts. Now, we looked at this in the previous slide. These osteoblasts are responsible for producing new bone. So sometimes they're referred to as bone forming cells. The process of forming new bone is referred to as osteogenesis or bone deposition. These osteoblasts will make and release the proteins and other components of the organic matrix of bone. For example, those collagen fibers that we illustrated in the previous slide, the osteoid, that's all produced by the osteoblasts. Furthermore, they'll promote the deposition of calcium salts, again, something that we looked at in the previous slide. That process is referred to as calcification. So these calcium salts are deposited onto the organic matrix, the osteoid. Now there's a term called mineralization, and that just essentially means we add minerals to bone. Calcium happens to be an example of a mineral. So therefore, calcification is just essentially a type of mineralization. So just so that we're clear as far as this bony matrix is concerned, so we talked about bone, and we know that it's part inorganic matrix plus part organic matrix. And taken together, we end up with the bony matrix. The last type of bone cells are the osteoprogenitor cells, also referred to as osteogenic cells. And these cells will arise from the mesenchymal or mesenchyme cells. So if you recall, these mesenchymal or mesenchyme cells are connective tissue stem cells. They maintain the population of osteoblasts, these osteoprogenitor cells, that is. They're important in the repair of fractures and as well as bone remodeling, and something that we're going to look at later on. So where do we find these osteoprogenitor cells? Well, we find them in the intercellular layer 
also called the osteogenic layer of the periosteum. That too, we will talk about later. And of course, the endosteum, which again, we'll also discuss later on. The last bone cells that we have are the osteoclasts. Now, these bone cells, these osteoclasts, destroy or erode bone. Basically, they're bone-destroying cells. The process whereby they destroy or erode bone is referred to as osteolysis or bone resorption. Now, these osteoclasts are big. They're gigantic. They're giant cells with 50-plus nuclei. And the reason being is because each osteoclast start off as pre-osteoclast cells or osteoclast precursors. So what we have are these individual osteoclast precursor cells that will fuse together to give us one giant osteoclast. So each nucleus that we find in the cytoplasm of one osteoclast will represent a nucleus that came from each of these osteoclast precursor. Now, these osteoclasts are derived from stem cells that produce white blood cells. They are not derived from the osteoprogenitor cell. So if we look at this diagram below, what we have here is your osteoprogenitor cell which will differentiate into our bone-forming cells, the osteoblasts. And when the osteoblasts are done producing the bony matrix, then we have a mature bone cell referred to as an osteocyte. So the osteoprogenitor cell does not differentiate into an osteoclast. So these osteoclasts, once again, come from stem cells that produces the white blood cells. Now, these osteoclasts secrete acids and digestive enzymes that will dissolve the bony matrix. And in doing so, the stored minerals in bone is released into blood. For example, calcium. So let's go back to this image that I drew. So we have this big, giant osteoclast, and it releases acids. So these acids are meant to dissolve or to erode the inorganic matrix, which are primarily the calcium salts. And so in doing so, as it's destroying or as the acids released by these osteoclasts erode at the inorganic matrix of bone, then the calcium is released into blood. Osteoclasts will also secrete enzymes such as collagenase. So what do these collagenase enzymes do? Well, what they'll do is they'll dissolve or break down the organic matrix of bone, the osteoid, which is primarily your collagen fibers. So the collagenase is meant to break down the collagen fibers, which makes up most of the organic matrix of bone. Now, one last thing I just want to point out is that if we look at the osteoclasts, they have what are called ruffled borders. So these ruffled borders are essentially just extensions of their plasma membrane and increases the surface area. So therefore, more surface area, more release of these acids and collagenase to basically, once again, destroy or erode the bony matrix.